Why do people that do wrong get the most material possessions? First of all, possessions or materials have to do with your work. If you don't have no materials and no possessions, it's because you're lazy. Let's just call it what it is. If you're, if you're looking at someone else because of their materials, because I always get that from me. People always look at what I got and they start to hate. They become jealous. They become envious. And I don't know why they're jealous of me. I put in the work. If you put in the work and you earn, then what is the problem? So it's not necessarily that somebody's doing wrong. You're just jealous of that person's success. Possessions don't fall from the sky. You got to work to get it. You don't get a house because you prayed for it. You don't get a car because you prayed for it. You don't buy clothes with prayer. You need money. Okay. Earth is given into the hands of the wicked, according to the book of Job. I'll break this down in a few. This foolish ninja, Ringo TV. First of all, <laughs> who are you working for? That's the most important question here. Okay, for those of you who frequently visited this channel, you know I have a series titled Satanic Employment. Okay, so who are you working for? Is your employment satanic? All right, that's number one. Number two, Ringo TV. Were the Hebrews who were afflicted during the transatlantic slave trade, were those men and women lazy? I want you to answer that. Not only Ringo TV, but those of you in the comments, I want you to answer this for him as well. Okay, also, were the plantation owners, they had a lot of possessions during the transatlantic slave trade. Were they hardworking? Answer, please. Again, this is another illusion of the Matrix. This bozo, Ringo TV, puts on a costume every night with a pair of Jordans, and he builds a studio for the sake of witchcraft with sounds and lights to put you under a spell every night and convince you white supremacy don't stink. Okay, forgive me, guys. I'm going to start reading more of your comments Many of you have come here saying you unsubscribe from this duel. So I got to make sure for transparency's sake that we break down what hard work is. Okay. Sometimes people can work hard for witchcraft for the sake of the enemy using them as a vessel. Then if you don't believe me, a lot of spirits can possess someone to have strength that they don't have on their own. Okay, remember the man who was cutting himself in the tombs when Christ cast the demons out of him, he had legions of demons in him. Okay, this man had abnormal strength because of all those spirits that possessed him. Okay, so let's not be vague here and talk about hard work if you got possessions. No, again, we're going to get into the scriptures. The earth is given into the hands of the wicked. All right. So I wanted to establish that framework first, okay? Getting into this series, white supremacy is a packaged deal, okay? And I'm not going to waste any more time. We're going straight to Job chapter 9, verse 24. It says, the earth is given to the hands of the wicked, okay? So who gives it to the wicked? That's another question, and this Clearly, the Most High, the Most High gives the earth into the hands of the wicked. Because Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all is fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Okay, the sun rises and sets on the just and the unjust, seed time and harvest time. Okay, it's all by the hands of the Most High. Obviously, it is God who hangs the earth on nothing. But back to Joel 9.24, it says, He, speaking about the wicked, covers the faces of the judges thereof. I will dive deeper into this later in the series, but basically, there is a covenant over the earth. 
I've coined this a lease agreement between God and the wicked, with Satan working on the left hand side, described as the God of this world. Okay, Satan is the God of this world. He cannot do anything without the agreement of the lessee. Okay, stay with me. Let's go to 2 Kings 21, 12 through 15. It says, verse 12, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle, and I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. Okay, Ahab at one point was king of Israel. Okay, he had a lease agreement with the Most High. Okay, and of course, Ahab was a wicked king. But let's continue. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish. Okay, we know Jerusalem to this day has went into captivity. Okay, it's talking about the children of Israel. So they were disobedient and they worship false gods. Continuing, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance, the lease agreement, okay, because remember the promised land, and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become victims of plunder to all their enemies. Verse 15, because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt even to this day. Okay, so I answered that second question there. Were the children of Israel, God's chosen people, who were afflicted during the transatlantic slave trade, were they lazy? No, they were up under a curse. All right, I just read you the curse there. There are many other scriptures for that. All right, but Rango TV has said in other videos, that he don't believe we're under a curse. So the children of Israel were technically one of the first nations to have a least obligation over the earth before the Lord. Not only are they in captivity unto this day, but before this dispensation, centuries ago, they also went into captivity under Babylon and what is called spiritual Egypt to this day. I will cover the captivity of Jerusalem in the book of Deuteronomy 28 later in this series. So thus far, I've already established using the scriptures that God only gives the earth for something in return, exalting himself in glory. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You cannot serve God in mammon. Okay? White supremacy is a packaged Deal. Let's go to Romans chapter 11, verse 16 through 23. Before I break down this passage any further, I want to put everything in context because the seminary schools are sanctioned by European banks. The white churches are built off the bloodshed of our ancestors. And these Edomite pastors, most of them refuse to thoroughly convey to sheep the outstanding sin debt. You know, the generational curses from their forefathers. Man cannot outlive his sins. The books have to be balanced. If the fathers don't pay for their sins, God visits it upon their children. If their generations continue to die in peace with their riches kept in the family, those heathens are transported to the lake of fire by tormenting evil spirits. While here on the earth, the debt still remains outstanding, or rather the blood of the innocent cries out from the earth against them. This is why Cain was so afraid after he killed Abel. God explained to him that death was coming to him in the form of bloodshed, and Cain feared for his life. Revelation 13.10 says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. I hope you're following me. White supremacy is a packaged deal. 
And this is also a salvation message because Christ gave specific instructions for them to follow and be saved. So I'm going to read from James chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. Then we'll go to Romans 11, as I promised. So James chapter 5, starting at verse 1, it says, Come now, you rich, weep, and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, talking about the transatlantic slave trade, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Talking about the police, always they put, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Then when they gun one of us down, they say, hey, he was resisting. I fear for my life. You see that? Verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Okay? So, the Most High used seed time and harvest. Again, he talks about you reap what you sow. Okay, the Most High speaks in parables using farming and agriculture to represent the deeds of man. Okay, from a spiritual standpoint, what has man done? What are the fruits? By their fruits, you shall know their deeds. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 11, verse 16 through 23. Okay, verse 16, it says, For if the first fruit is holy. See, he's talking again about fruit. See, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, talking about these Gentiles, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Verse 18. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Okay, there's a scripture that says it is an advantage to the Jew because to them were committed the oracles of God. All right, and I'm going to talk about that later in this series as well. Okay, the Gentiles were not the natural branches. They didn't know the Most High for 4,000 years. That's what I mean when I say faith deficit. Okay, obviously they don't have a financial deficit. Okay, but we have to talk about the blessings of Jacob and Esau to give you that deeper level of understanding of what I'm trying to say. Okay, a faith deficit was established in Genesis 25 and Genesis 27, when God, through Isaac, gave Jacob and Esau their separate blessings, okay? And through Rebekah, he informed her that two nations were in her womb, all right? But I'm not going to go there quite yet, but stay tuned. Let's continue, finish reading Romans 11. Okay, verse 18, do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Verse 20, well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith, but do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Verse 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail. Severity. 
but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Right? So again, what exactly does it mean by natural branches and grafted in? Well, as I have stated before, the Gentiles have a 4,000 year faith deficit. So in Genesis 25, 23, we learn that there were two nations in the womb of Rebekah and that one nation will be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. Why does it matter that one nation is stronger than the other? Because Psalm 51, 17 says the sacrifices of God is a broken and contrite spirit. Matthew 24, 13 says, He who endures to the end shall be saved. Okay, Acts 14, 22 says, Through much tribulation we enter into the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 14, 2 says, Judah mourneth. Okay, our people have endured the exploits of the transatlantic slave trade castration, eugenics, Jim Crow, Willie Lynch, the first exodus from Egypt, the prison industrial complex, and so much more. Okay? It takes strength to inherit the kingdom of God. This is why a so-called white man should be very afraid because he hasn't had any adversity. Okay? He's never had to be tested for the sake of Christ. Scriptures say that those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now that takes a lot of hard work. All right. In Luke 6.25, when Christ said, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Well, everyone who's ever lived has laughed at some point. This is how you know he doesn't mean that literally. Okay, this refers to an indignant entitled, frivolous kind of people, okay? The so-called white man, because remember in Romans 11, the Gentiles are grafted in, and Paul said, you, the Gentiles, do not support the root, but the root supports you, because they're saying the branches were broken off that they may be grafted in, but that's not the case. If God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either, okay? Because Esau sold his birthright for a morsel of fool. So let's be transparent in expressing the components of the packaged deal granted to white supremacists for a period of time by the Most High. Genesis 27 is more telling because it gives us an intricate, sinuous perspective to the blessings Jacob and Esau received, and more importantly, how it relates to salvation. Because one thing we will debunk in this series is the notion that you can have your cake and eat it too. No, sir. Jacob's blessing is spiritual. Esau's is carnal. White supremacy is a package deal and the penultimate epitome of their 4,000-year faith deficit inaugurated in Genesis 25. Again, what do I mean by 4,000 year faith deficit? Well, let's read from Genesis chapter 27, verse 1 through 40, starting at verse 1. It says, Now when it came to pass, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim that he could not see, that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field, 
to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Verse 7, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father, that he may eat it, and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Catch that, okay, because the Most High is so deep that he's not bound by time. So when you read curses in the book, they're connected to things that happened before that curse was announced by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy 28. And so many generations after Moses passed. See, Jacob, the scriptures say, if the thief be found, he must restore sevenfold. Although Jacob was blessed, it was also a curse. And a lot of guys are not out here teaching this. Okay, it, it, that's real deep. But let me continue. Verse 13. But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. Okay, even though she said this, the soul that sins shall be died. The, the wages of sin is death. Okay, that's a law of God. Verse 14, and he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her son, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. See, he was lying on God too. <laughs> Verse 21. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. Verse 25. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game, so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate. And he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven 
of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Okay, it's talking about the kings of Judah because the kings of, of Judah and over the nation Israel, they were once over the Edomites. Okay, particularly King David. He had authority over the Edomites. Continuing, be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Verse 30. Now it happened, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father, and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came. And I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, me also, O my father. Verse 35. But he said, Your brother came with deceit, and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Verse 37. Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine, I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Verse 39. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword, you shall live. Okay, catch that. Because as I'll get into later, the scriptures also say, but if you live by the sword, you will also die by the sword. Okay, so Esau was so desperate for a blessing that Isaac's letting him know, look, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be blessed, but you're going to have to kill to get it. Okay, continuing, he said, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now, please make note that Isaac told Esau he shall be of the fatness of the earth, but you're going to have to live by the sword to inherit everything you get. But this is why Esau wanted to kill Jacob, even though he also received the blessing. Okay, because even Esau at that time understood the penalty that was laid upon Cain. Okay, because Cain had killed his brother. Okay, and the blood that cries out from the earth. So he understood the laws of the Most High. So he's looking at this situation like, I should have got my blessing without having to do all of this. So I just explained to you. The 4,000 year faith deficit that was initiated unto these Edomites. Okay, to this day, they're living in the fatness of the land. Okay, so in Romans 11, this is why Paul was speaking to the Romans, who is Esau. This is why he was speaking to them in this manner, where it sounds like he's kind of being condescending toward them, but he's just being straightforward. Letting them know, hey, look, you got a 4,000 year faith deficit. Okay, you didn't have a covenant with the Most High because Esau, he, he was complaining 
that Jacob stole his birthright. He tricked him out of his birthright, but Esau didn't have to eat the morsel of food because he was so hungry. Okay. The laws of God requires fasting. Ever since Adam had sinned, man would have to fast and deny himself to get back in fellowship with the Most High. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5. Well, we'll start at 1 Thessalonians 4, starting at verse 3 through 5. It says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse 5, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. All right? Esau will go on to marry the foreign women. The scriptures in Genesis go on to say how Isaac and Rebekah were displeased with him for marrying these foreign women because the Most High commanded the Israelites not to marry the Canaanites, not to make covenants with them. And this began the trace of that bloodline that would separate the Gentiles, not only the Edomites, but the Moabites, the Amalekites, and all of these heathen nations, Ashkenaz, all of these heathen nations would be separated from the Most High for centuries, okay, for at least 4,000 years, all right? So this concludes part one. White supremacy is a package deal. I know I gave you guys a lot in this first part here, but it's very paramount that you understand the roots of sin and blood covenants, okay? And that man cannot outlive his sins. That's the most important thing. The sins of the father, as I also explained with Jacob, even though Jacob was blessed, he was also cursed. Okay, from the blessing that he received from Isaac and from the birthright he tricked Esau out of. All right. So, guys, let me know your thoughts and enjoy the rest of your day.